day in Manhattan Clear as could be Till the planes hit the buildings And changed history They stood for an hour Once the damage was done But then suddenly crumbled Ten seconds they were gone There were cascading projections of steel into dust Looked like explosions, but it was not discussed. So I turn off the TV and shut out the lights. It's all just illusion right in front of my eyes. Well, I'm not scared. Sharing the truth about 9-11 Now building number seven Dropped the cleanest of all Yet the world still knows nothing Of this amazing free fall There was no real reason It wasn't hit by Yet you can't see the flames You see cascading projections of steel into dust Looks like demolition but it's never discussed So I turn off the TV And shut out the lights It's all just illusion The bigger the lie, the more people believe And the deeper the fear, the more easily we are deceived I Turn off the TV And I shut out the lies It's all just illusions Welcome to year seven, episode two of 9-11 was an inside job. And yeah, this is the 18th day of my untreated toothache because Kaiser and the Oregon Health Care Plan can't get together on how much they're going to pay each other or pay each other, reimburse each other for the services. Kaiser doesn't want to do something that they might not get reimbursed for. Anyway... I read the bylaws or the paper that they sent me anyway that said I have the right to immediate emergency care and 18 days later I'm still not treated. I think I'm going to talk to a lawyer. All right, enough said. Before we get going, I have a special announcement right here. Um, you, you know that they've been talking, especially uh, people like Nancy Pelosi and those folks, been talking about the definition of a journalist you know oh you're not a journalist you're on the internet you just blog you're a blogger you're not a journalist well I got news for you and I'll read it right here a federal appeals court has ruled that bloggers and the general public have the same protection of the First Amendment as journalists when sued for defamation 
Okay, now that kind of cinches it if it's a, you know, in the matter of legal liability, financial legal liability, we're all journalists, okay, we all have the same protections, then they can't turn you away when you're, you show up in an event and you're a journalist. Well, anyway, the federal court's ruling came after a new trial in a defamation case. An Oregon bam bankruptcy trustee was the plaintiff against a Montana blogger who wrote on the internet that the trustee criminally mishandled a bankruptcy case. The, uh, the original court case was won by the lawyer, but it was overturned by the, let me scroll down here so I can get it exactly right. Um, Okay, here's, here's what the, uh, the judge, Andrew Hurwitz, wrote for a three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit, uh, the, the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, okay? And he wrote, because Coggs' blog post address, that he was the, the one who was originally ordered to pay $2.5 million, um, because it addressed a matter of public concern, even assuming that Gertz is limited to such a speech, in other words, you know, it, he could, he doesn't have to be limited to just talking about matters of public concern is what the judge said. But anyway, the district court, the one that found uh, the plaintiff, uh, in, in favor of the plaintiff, it says the district court should have instructed the jury that it could not find Cox liable for defamation unless it found that she acted negligently. Anyway, so... Basically, it's a victory for all of us. We're, we we don't have to argue about what's a journalist and what isn't anymore. The Supreme Court or the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals is upholding that. And I just wanted to show you some things here. Get ready on camera three there. Uh, Infowars magazine, and here's here's a good one. Oh, uh, the green areas on my magazine are showing transparent. But what this is is the dinosaur media. It says CNN and uh, Fox and things like that. And up here it says it's the, the new alternative media. It's about to drive the dinosaur media extinct. It says the mainstream media is dead. The revolution starts now. That's Alex Jones. Now here's the other one. This is the latest one. It shows... The modern dictator, President Obama. Okay, and then how about Happy New Year's with all the fireworks? <laughs> 1984. Okay, well, now let's just move on. I told you before that I uh, am in the process of making a video that we've already recorded, and I just have to get finish editing it, uh, with David Chandler. So as a kind of a special today, I'm just going to show about eight minutes of it. It was a, It's going to be a 42-minute video, um, and there's a lot of other stuff to put in it. But here's just the kind of raw part with David Chandler. And normally we'd be putting in pictures and other insets that show what he's talking about. But this will just give you a, a kind of a tantalizer for what's going to... Uh, so for what you're going to see in the finished product. So if you're ready in there, go ahead and take it away. Well, we're close. Uh, with trying to cover the whole waterfront in discussing 9-11 is that uh, how strongly we are certain of various elements, uh, it varies a lot. Like what happened at the Pentagon, what happened out in Pennsylvania where the plane went down, what happened at the World Trade Center. Um, I have come to believe that what we really need to do is to uh, focus on the elements of the um, events of 9-11 that have been the most strongly analyzed and established so that we know what happened and we know that the official story is a fabrication at that stage. Okay. I've come up with, uh, I'd, I'd call it three plus one. There's three main points that I think, uh, if you focus on these, I think you can establish really beyond doubt that 9-11 uh, had to have been orchestrated with insider complicity that goes uh, very broadly in the U.S. intelligence services and military industrial complex, something like that. There had to have been connections at that kind of a level, but we don't start there. We're starting with hard, um, hard evidence. 
The first is the dynamics of the way the buildings came down. We have good uh, material about that. The second is the fires and the temperatures that were achieved in these fires. And the third is the fact that we've actually found uh, remnants of a material called nanothermite uh, in the dust. And these are the three things I think that are the strongest um, case that we have that something very uh, uh, these, I think, are the strongest case that we have that something very sinister is going on in 9-11. It's not something that was um, just a, uh, an outside uh, attack from Arabs or Afghans or anybody else who you want to think was involved here. I say three plus one. The other element is the cover-up. Probably as strong as any of the main lines of evidence is evidence of a cover-up. And when there's a cover-up, it's, in my mind, that strong evidence that there's something somebody wants covered up. And so I'd like to go back and focus on, in terms of what, are, what do we know on each of these grounds. Okay, you're hot. Okay. All right, well, well, you see how raw it was, and uh, we, I had a little while, a little trouble getting that background set up, but we're going to show you the, a clip from near the end, it, in fact, it's the very end, part of the conclusion about what can you do? Well, you know, everybody asks, what can I do? And he has a kind of an answer, and we'll go ahead and play this. I hope you're getting tantalized and not angry. <laughs> Because uh, I'd, I'd like to see the whole thing myself. And I'm sure that everybody else will see it too. Okay, they're telling me it's ready to go, so we're going to see the, the conclusion. So one question I face a lot when I talk about 9-11, especially in front of groups of people, is they say, well, what can we do? This seems like such a large-scale event. And it's something that's in the past. What good does it do to dwell on this? Well, I want to point out, first of all, that 9-11 really did change the world. It changed the way the United States functions. It changed the description of our democracy, if you can still call it a democracy. And the first primary thing, I think, in terms, in terms of a response to 9-11 is we must demand our democracy back. And this can take a thousand different forms. So if your uh, area of activism is to ending the wars, one of the things, I've made a little list here. Some of the things that we need to do, and um, there's a lot more, but we need to end this bogus war on terror. Um, it, the whole idea that we were attacked by Arab Islamic fundamentalists is a false premise. Okay. This war on terror is actually a reign of terror, where we have been raining literally terror from the skies on people in Pakistan and other areas of uh, the world in the name of counterterrorism. We need to end these drone assassinations, so fighting to end that particular uh, element uh, is another issue. We need to, in a larger sense, end this death grip of the military-industrial complex. Eisenhower warned us about, and it's been continuing on. Why is it that we're getting into these wars? There are people who make gigantic amounts of money off of war. And um, so I won't even go there other than to say this is something that needs to be reversed. It will take a long, hard slog uh, to turn this around. This is all tied in with the fossil fuel industry. What we're seeing is a, an end of the age of oil that's approaching, whether it's sooner or later, depending on who you talk to. But we, there's a lot of geopolitical positioning going on to control the final last gasp of uh, the oil supplies, uh, and the, when it, whether it's oil or natural gas or tar sands or all of these issues. 
we simply need to move to uh, other kinds of energy so that we uh, don't have this um, uh, the proprietary, you know, I own what's under your piece of land kind of a mentality that's uh, driving these wars. We need to end the influence of money on politics. How can you have a democracy if dollars speak louder than words? And that's what we have. It's being legitimized by a Supreme Court that's been allowing uh, uh, corporations to have vo the voice and have the rights to freedom of speech as though they were individual people. And fundamentally, we need to end this incredible economic polarization where the top tiny fraction of a percent controls such a major fraction of our economy. We need to have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people again. In other words, we need to get back to a kind of a democracy that we could recognize. So why focus on 9-11? Well, 9-11 is where things started to change. It was the event that precipitated these other changes. And it's uh, important to have a state of consciousness to realize that uh, what's been going on is something that somebody caused to happen. Okay. Do you think, do I think we're going to see Bush and Cheney and various other members of the administration uh, put in jail? I probably doubt that. I don't think it's going to go that direction. I don't think that would even necessarily um, um, be the satisfaction. We don't need to simply focus at that scale. We need to focus on what has been done to us as a democracy and we need to reverse that whole process. Okay, I think that's what I wanted to say in this um, short presentation. I hope it's short. We'll see how it turns out. Thank you. Okay, uh, that'll be good. We'll see how short it is. It's going to be like 42 minutes, like I said. And, uh, well, we've got lots of things going on. I'm glad I changed to weekly because, you know, there's lots of things that are slipping through the cracks even weekly here. And uh, we're, the next thing we're going to do is go to uh, James Corbett, the Corbett Report, and um, Media Monarchy. Now, what we're going to be talking about is uh, the International Criminal Court is, going, is set up to prosecute UK uh, officials for Iraqi war crimes. Okay, now... That's the closest that any Western forces have been to that type of prosecution. There's a devastating dossier on abuse by the UK forces in Iraq, and it went to the International Criminal Court. And then the IC, I got it already, I got it. Can't you be subtle? Okay, <laughs> they're sitting there flashing the light after I tried to signal them. Anyway, okay, we'll, we'll just let it go. Uh, We'll go ahead and play it. ICC urged to investigate war crimes of UK politicians. That's that's the one we're going to do right now, and it's about 16 minutes, so enjoy. <laughs> Welcome. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, and we welcome you back to another jam-packed episode of The New World Next Week. And everything you need is at NewWorldNextWeek.com. Links, sources, high-quality, low-quality video, and so much more. James, let's begin this episode with the wide-view geopolitical story that we'll take from The Independent. As the devastating dossier on abuse by U.K. forces in Iraq goes to the International Criminal Court. A devastating 250-page dossier detailing allegations of beatings, electrocution, mock executions, and sexual assault has been presented to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and could result in some of Britain's leading defense figures facing prosecu prosecution for systematic war crimes. General Sir Peter Wall, the head of the British Army, former Defense Secretary Jeff Hoon, and a former defense minister, Adam Ingram, are among those named in the report entitled The Responsibility of UK Officials for War Crimes Involving Systematic Detainee Abuse in Iraq from 2003 to 2008. 
The damning dossier draws on cases for more than 400 Iraqis representing, quote, thousands of allegations of mistreatment amounting to war crimes of torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. They range from the disgusting laundry list, hooding prisoners, burning, electric shocks, threats to kill, cultural and religious humiliation. Other forms of abuse include sexual assault, mock executions, threats of rape, death, torture, etc. The formal complaint to the ICC lodged yesterday is the culmination of several years' work by public interest lawyers and the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, ECCHR. It calls for an investigation into the alleged war crimes under Article 15 of the Rome Statute. The dossier, seen by The Independent, and James, unless you know more than I do on this, there's not a copy of this floating around. I looked for it. It's the most detailed ever submitted to the ICC's Office of the Prosecutor on War Crimes allegedly committed by British forces in Iraq. The court has already acknowledged that there was little doubt that war crimes were were committed. James. Absolutely. Well, I haven't seen the dossier itself either, but hopefully that will emerge so people can uh, take a look at it. But at any rate, this is it. The gauntlet is down. And for anyone whose minds are still trapped in the Matrix, this is a chance for them to snap out of it and to watch this process at work as the ICC will eventually, inevitably put these charges to bed and not do anything about them. Or there will be some sort of mock show type of trial that will uh, ultimately devolve perhaps down to the UK government and end up trying a few uh, low-lying generals or or what have you and completely obfuscate the absolute criminal uh, responsibility of the the politicians who who fostered the environment which made this possible. And for people who go and read this full report at The Independent, it will be quite clear that this is something that was fostered by the uh, the top-level brass and uh, the top-level politicians, and it was something that went on for years. And again, I'm sure most of the people watching this broadcast don't need to be told that. I think they already understood that serious war crimes have been committed, of course, by the UK uh, government uh, officials who were in charge of this, as the US officials, of course, in charge of, uh, of their troops as well. Um, one of the startling things about this uh, particular article for me was uh, that, in fact, the, the, the court, the ICC, has already admitted that the war crimes have taken place, but they de- declined to prosecute them before because there was a lack of, uh, of, of a number of incidents um, for them to, to consider hearing the case. So reading from the article, it says the court has already acknowledged that there was little doubt that war crimes were committed. In 2006, it concluded there was a reasonable basis to believe that crimes within the jurisdiction of the ICC had been committed, namely willful killing and inhuman treatment. At that time, prosecutors cited the low number of cases fewer than 20 as a reason for not mounting an investigation. So yes, war crimes were committed, but we're not going to try them. There's only, there was only a, a dozen or so. Now here's this dossier uh, compiling all of these extra charges and extra uh, incidents. So really the gauntlet is down and the, the ball is in the ICC's court. I am not holding my breath. I do not think this is going to end up with uh, Tony Blair in the gallows. But uh, but again, hey, I'd love to be proven wrong. And uh, it, when and if I am, I'll, I'll be happy to eat my hat. And when in, if I'm not, I hope the people who are still uh, caught in that matrix and believe that somehow the UN and the ICC and all of these institutions are going to be the saviors of humanity will perhaps eat their hat and realize that this is a completely 100% show trial system that's designed, as uh, the report goes on to say, is designed to try Africans in Africa, basically. That's all the ICC has done so far. James, I'll sneak in one related note before we move to our second story, and that is, of course, speaking of war criminals, Errol Sharon is dead. Having said that, we'll move to our second story this week via the New American as the CFR Dream Team sweeps the Fed. The rumors have been confirmed. Obama's plan to name Stanley Fisher as vice chairman of the Federal Reserve was made official last week, January 10th. At the same time he announced Fisher's appointment, the president also named Lael Brainerd and Jerome Powell to positions as governors on the seven-member Federal Reserve Board. Fed Chairman, new Fed Chairman, James, which we have not really spoken about here on New World Next Week, new Federal Reserve Chairperson Janet Yellen and Vice Chairman Fisher also serve as governors. Unremarked in any of the media coverage of these appointments is the significant fact that all four of these Obama nominations to one of the most powerful institutions on the planet are not only members, but high-level operatives of 
the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR, the premier U.S. think tank that has been promoting world government for the past century. Federal Reserve Board Governor Daniel Tarullo is also a CFR member, and as the New American reported December 29, 2013, Stanley Fisher was named this past September to be a distinguished fellow in residence at Pratt House, the CFR's New York City headquarters. In that same article, the New American noted that many additional CFR members and officers have rotated in and out of top positions at the Fed, Treasury, and big Wall Street firms such as former Fed Chairman Paul Volcker and Alan Greenspan, as well as current Federal Reserve Regional Bank Presidents William Dudley out of New York City, Dennis P. Lockhart out of Atlanta, Georgia, Richard W. Fisher out of Dallas, Texas, and current Federal Reserve Board of Governor members Daniel K. Tarullo, Jerome H. Powell, and Janet Yellen. This curious Pratt House influence extends back over the past century to the, as we just noted a few weeks ago, the 100th anniversary of the Federal Reserve, to such top Wall Street insiders as Paul Warburg, who is the chief architect of and propagandist for the Federal Reserve Act and one of the founding directors of the Council on Foreign Relations. Back to the present day, in his announcement of the fisher Brainerd powell nominations, President Barry Satoro stated, quote, These three distinguished individuals have the proven experience, judgment, and deep knowledge of the financial system to serve at the Federal Reserve during this important time for our economy, end quote, James. So the takeaway on this is that the CFR doesn't just stand for the Council on Foreign Relations. It stands for the Council of Federal Reserve. Absolutely. Well, we always encourage people to take a look at the articles, and I hope that they will go and read this article because uh, that's a lot of information to take in there, and it goes into a lot of depth about those connections and the Federal Reserve and the, the Council on Foreign Relations being intertwined since both of the uh, the foundings of both of these institutions back in that uh, in that heady period in, around the, f the First World War. And uh, doing my own research for the, uh, the the Federal Reserve documentary that I'm working on, it, it absolutely is apparent to me the, the absolute nexus that exists between the Federal Reserve, the banking community, um, a, a eventually the founding of the United Nations and the, sort of the internationalists in that, in that uh, sphere. So uh, it, it is a nexus there that, that persists to this day, that has persisted for the century of the lifespan of the Federal Reserve, that, that creature that won't die. And uh, so this is absolutely important for people to understand that. And just to add, you know, another element into the mix, I guess they were trying to cover all their bases. Stanley Fisher is not only the Distinguished fellow in residence at the uh, Pratt House of the CFR, but also um, not only a U.S. Israeli dual citizen, but in fact the former uh, governor of the Bank of Israel. Um, in another one of these bizarre moves where the international banking oligarchy is unmasking itself for the international um, group that they are with no allegiance to any country whatsoever. We saw Mark Carney going over from the Bank of Canada to the Bank of England last year in a bizarre move. Now we've got Stanley Fisher moving over from the Bank of Israel to take uh, the Fed. Vice Fed chairmanship um, uh, again, just a, a, a really bizarre move. And also, he's he's also the person who supervised the PhD thesis of Ben Bernanke and uh, and another high ranking Fed official. So um, uh, just I mean, just craziness going on here. And it to my mind, this brings back the idea that it's always the second in command that you want to be taking a look at in these big institutions because often the f the first person is just the puppet they put out front. But just like uh, Cheney in the Bush White House, or just like uh, Ayman Al Zawahiri in al-Qaeda back in the days when Osama bin Laden was the front puppet. Um, it's always the, the second in command who seems to be the one who's really pulling the strings. So I'm going to have my eyes on Stanley Fisher as well as Janet Yellen going into this new Fed chairmanship. And uh, well, at any rate, it should be interesting. And once again, I'll just ask people to hold off on uh, as I'm working on this feature length Federal Reserve documentary. It is going to take a while to get out there, but I think it'll be worth it in the end. Absolutely. I, I know I'm excited for it. James, I'll mention one economic-related note before we move to our third and final story this week. People not in labor force soars to a record 91.8 million. That would be the lowest participation rate in this whole game we call an economy since 1978, James. So having said that and speaking about economies and something that's integral to its economy but also seems tied in this sort of suicide pact to death that would be my home state's relationship with coal so 
those of you probably don't need any reminder, as it's been one of the largest stories going on in the country over the last week. Massive, if in effect, if not in reach, chemical spill in West Virginia. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands without water. You've followed the story. Let's get a little bit of an update that this comes today, James, as er earlier, January 15th. As spill fallout continues, Freedom Industries cited at a second West Virginia site. And we'll take this from KSDK. The company whose spill contaminated the water supply for 300,000 West Virginians has been cited for violations at a second facility where it's storing chemicals. Department of Environmental Protection spokesman Tom Aloise said inspectors found five violations Monday at a nitro site where Freedom Industries moved its coal cleaning chemicals after last Thursday's spill. Inspectors found that, like the Charleston facility where the leak originated, the nitro site lacked appropriate secondary containment. In Charleston, a porous containment wall allowed the chemical to ooze into the Elk River. Aloise said Wednesday that the state might force Freedom to relocate the material again. The nitro facility isn't near a river or a water supply, but other violations include failing to follow storm water and groundwater guidelines, not filing or filling monitoring reports, and not properly storing drums with potential contaminants. James, to break this down, they made a mess, so they had to move all their crap to another spot that's also making a mess. And the state's saying, well, we might make you move it to another third place where you'll continue to spread this mess. Now, James, another update to this story that, that again, is just kind of coming out today, and take it from the Charleston Gazette out of West Virginia. Influx of ER visits reported following lifted do-not-use advisories. Area emergency rooms are seeing an influx of patients reporting symptoms related to exposure to chemical-tainted water, despite the fact that West Virginia American Water has deemed the water in many areas safe to use. Dr. Raul Gupta, health officer for the Canal Charleston Health Department, said 101 patients visited area emergency rooms in the 36-hour span ending 7 a.m. Wednesday morning. They reported symptoms related to tainted water. I think all I can say, James, is, is this reminds me of three words. Christy Todd Whitman. The air is safe to breathe. The water is safe to breathe. Don't worry about it. Pay no attention. Just go right back to it. James. Yeah, it's uh, sad how relevant that uh, that one lie continues to be as it reverberates around through to today. And we, we have to be reminded of that from time to time. Yes, your government will lie directly to your face, even if it means your potential death. Um, just another, unfortunately, terrible uh, situation for the people of West Virginia. I know you have a lot of family and friends still out there. Have you got any personal experiences or, or uh, heard anything that from the personal side that you can share? I had not firsthand, but there, yeah, definitely have friends who were without water for, for several days who live. I mean, Char Charleston's the capital. It's the biggest city in West Virginia. So when you take away water from the capital, and that's kind of the main hub, that's where government is. That's where other industry obviously is. And that's where just regular folks are working, have not had water. The flip side to that, an hour away where, uh, where I'm from, where my parents still live, I think everything's A-OK -okay and it's a different different waterway so the contamination has not won't go there that's the most that, that I know but again it's just that <laughs> I wish my home state could be in the news for something other than a horrific environmental catastrophe but what are you going to do? It, it <laughs> continues to live up to the uh, media monarchy tag of uh, West Virginia worries doesn't it? Yeah that's sad and it's just another reminder that disaster whether man-made or natural can strike at any time and you could be without water or food or shelter or what have you electricity and the question is, as always is are you prepared? Do you know what to do in those situations? And on that very note for people who uh, whose answer might be no uh, I direct them over to the uh, Tragedy and Hope YouTube channel where they're amassing some playlists on self-reliance how to start a fire, how to make a, a makeshift uh, tent or, or what have you. So so some uh, some just practical skills that people can actually use. And once again, I mean, this this information is at our fingertips. Let's be using it for something practical just in case, you know, the lights go out or what have you. Mm -hmm. James, uh, just in closing, I'll, I'll note one thanks to Sam at Pirate Printing Company for the T-shirt. And for folks out there also to continue to submit stories on Twitter using hashtag New World Next Week. You can follow me at Media Monarchy. You can follow okay. him at... Yeah.
I, I brought it back because I was afraid they were going to launch into these advertisements that we can't have on uh, uh, cable access. Isn't it interesting about that water? The people that uh, trusted the uh, the government's declaration that the water was safe to drink, and they did, and had to go to the hospital. And I was thinking, shades of 9/11. Maybe they should ask the EPA for help. Yeah. And then he brought up Christy Todd Whitman, so he was already on top of it. Well, um, you know, there's a certain amount of attention you can pay to the n mainstream news, but somehow, in spite of the fact that I look at it every third week, whether I need to or not, somehow I missed the fact that it was Michelle Obama's birthday yesterday or day before, or something like that, I don't remember. And it was just jamming the news about it, but I didn't know that because I didn't watch it. But uh, I did happen to see President Obama, uh, Obama's speech on the NSA. And the one thing you know about it is, first of all, he's not changing a damn thing. The other thing that he, you know about it is that he's scared to death about being arrested for the crime that the NSA is committing and he's perpetrating. Um, and the forces are closing in on him. I mean, he can't exist much longer. He's going full dictatorship. I showed you that picture of, on the cover of the uh, InfoWars magazine. I don't need it again. Is it? Um, but, okay, our neighbor to the north of us, um, for those of you on the internet, we're here in Portland, Oregon, but just to the north of us is the, the great state of Washington. And the uh, the state of Washington just moved to uh, kind of put a stop to the NSA's involvement in their state with one one bold measure put it forward by a representative. We'll go ahead and play that, and uh, I'll be back. Welcome back. Now, you may remember that we had an interview with Michael Meharry with the Tenth Amendment Center, their efforts to constrain the NSA at the state level. And we see that there's a bill that's been introduced in Washington that has bipartisan support, as well as the ACLU joining in. So we have support from a broad spectrum of people. And we're going to talk to one of those co-sponsors. He's Matt Shea. He's a Spokane Valley representative in the state of Washington, District 4. Welcome, Representative Shea. Thank you for talking to us. Now, I, I guess to start this, I want to give you the guy who seems to have taken upon himself to be the poster child in favor of defending the NSA, and that's uh, Mark Andresen, I believe is the way his, his name's pronounced. He was the founder of Netscape. He's a big Silicon Valley venture capitalist, and he said, hey, we're spending billions of dollars, and these guys weren't spying. Uh, we'd be concerned about that. And he says, uh, isn't there a real discussion to be had that's not flashpoint? The NSA is evil cartoonish. Well, tell us your concerns. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. And second, secretly spying on your own citizens without due process is the very essence of tyranny. Yes. That is just incredible we're even having this conversation today. Clearly, the federal government, the three branches of the federal government, aren't going to restrain themselves. Therefore, it's left up to the states to restrain the federal government. And tell us the legislation that you're the co-sponsor on that's been introduced in Washington, because this is the first time that we've seen anything like this put in a state where the NSA actually has a large presence like they do in the Yakima facility? Well, first of all, the, the federal government is an agent of the states. I mean, the states are what created the federal government, so it's left up to the states sometimes to restrain the federal government when they clearly aren't going to. House Bill 2272, the Fourth Amendment Protection Act, does five things. First of all, it stops any support or assistance to, uh, for any state agency to the federal government regarding spying on our own citizens without a warrant. The second thing that it does is it deprives the federal government of any ability regarding uh, contracts and regarding the state funding or using any funds, assets, anything like that to help the federal government in that spying as well. And then next it deprives local governments of grant money to do the same thing. So that's the first four parts of it. The fifth part is nobody can use any illegally obtained evidence. We define that as evidence obtained without any sort of a warrant, which is what the NSA has been doing, monitoring our emails, monitoring our phone calls, monitoring what we buy, because that preserves the integrity of the system. If we allow that illegal evidence in, we're going to get a ton of court cases thrown out. 
number one. And number two, we shouldn't be doing that anyway. That's what the whole reason behind the Fourth Amendment is. General warrants were condemned by our founding fathers, most notably James Otis, and among many others, uh, John Adams is another example, because King George III's general warrants basically said that you could go in anytime, anywhere, for any reason, and search somebody's house, their effects, their papers. The Fourth Amendment is very clear that we are free and our effects, our affairs, our papers should be secure from unreasonable search and seizure. And here in Washington state, Article 1, Section 7 of our, our state constitution goes even farther and says that we should be secure in our privacy in our affairs. Yes. So it uses even stronger language. And when we talked to William Benny, he was very clear that according to internal guidelines, the NSA is maintaining that they haven't really seized your data or taken your data or searched your data as long as they keep it and as long as they hold it and they can even turn it over to the FBI or Homeland Security and they still don't consider that they have taken it. They're playing those kind of semantic games with us and your bill specifically addresses metadata because that's another semantic game they want to play with us. It, it absolutely is and in fact it goes the other way too with state agencies most notably the Washington State Patrol in conjunction with the Fusion Center here in Washington where they are working to monitor citizens. Most recently, the Million Mask March that happened here in Washington State, they monitored that, and then they went and shared that information with the federal government. This bill would put a stop to that and, and imposes three specific penalties. The first is if you are a government agent at the state level or below and you violate the provisions of this bill, you lose your job. And I think that's a very important incentive to actually protect people's constitutional rights. The second is if you're a company that is contracted out with the state and you're involved in this in any way, you lose your contract and you can never get one back with the state of Washington. And then lastly, the third thing is if you're someone that has violated the provisions of this bill, you are liable for a gross misdemeanor, so a criminal penalty, which I think is another critical component of the penalty phase. And then last but not least, we have a provision in there that gives the people a cause of action to actually enforce this. So we're putting the power back in the hands of the people to actually enforce the provisions of this bill and sue where they need to to make sure that their Fourth Amendment rights and the rights that they enjoy and are protected with the rest of the Constitution uh, can be enforced at the local level and by the individual. It's a great bill. Like you just pointed out, you make sure that the people have standing in a lawsuit. You've got clear prohibitions. Uh, you, you get around some of these semantics that they've put out there, as well as really having teeth in it. What are the chances of this getting passed? I know right now you've got some bipartisan sponsorship there. We do have bipartisan sponsorship, and that's one of the key things that the issues of freedom and liberty, they cross party lines. And so we do have bipartisan sponsorship. We've been working with both the 10th Amendment Center and the ACLU to make sure that we get uh, appropriate pressure put on to get this a hearing. It is currently in the Judiciary Committee in the House of Representatives. The chairwoman is Lori Jenkins, and we uh, have a phone number for her for, for your viewers and listeners so that they can actually call and help put some pressure on her to yes. uh, give this thing a hearing. And uh, Yeah, let's get that out. We wanted to do everything we can to, to, to help get this passed. What's her phone number? Absolutely. Her phone number is 360-786-7930. 786-7930. And it's Lori, L-A-U-R-I-E dot Jenkins, G, I'm sorry, J-I-N-K-I-N-S at L-E-G dot W-A dot G-O-V. Well, that's great. Is there any other information that you can give the audience that would, that things that they could do to help uh, move this along? Because this is very important because other bills have been introduced in other states, but uh, in some places where they don't really have a, a facility, an NSA facility like they do at Yakima, this could really have uh, some real effect there. Absolutely. I mean, if, if we don't get this issue right, I mean, where are we secure? Where are we truly free? If, if they can monitor our emails, they can monitor everything that we do on the Internet, they can monitor what we watch, they can monitor what we listen to, they can monitor what we buy, what we're going to end up doing is self-censoring which is the worst kind of tyranny. Yes. Self-censoring and, and just thinking, well, I've got to watch everything I say. I've got to watch everything I buy. That's why this is so important, and that's why we've got to get this right, and that's why the state ultimately has to step in between the federal government and the people and protect the people's constitutional rights, especially if the three branches of the federal government are not going to. That's right. Now, tomorrow we've got a speech from Obama. He's got a panel, a White House panel, that's going to make some proposals. 
proposals. I don't really expect to see much coming out of that. I think Rand Paul doesn't <laughs> expect to see much coming out, out, out of that either. He's calling it the fox guarding the hen house. So this is really where we need to put our efforts at the state level, stopping this at the state level, I believe. I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, I hear some people say, well, Matt, this is going to interfere with national security. This is going to put our national security in jeopardy. And you know what? National security is not an excuse to violate the Constitution of the United States or the Constitution of Washington State. Both of those constitutions were written in crisis for crisis. And I think we need to remember that and, and get away from all this emotional push to do that. My wife is from uh, Ukraine, fled communist Ukraine, and came over here to this country precisely because she didn't want to be monitored for being a Christian, monitored for being pro-life, monitored for being pro-gun, monitored for being pro-liberty and pro-freedom. And so I, I think this is one of those key things where we can actually learn from those folks that fled communism and fled tyranny, and we can make sure it doesn't happen here in the United States of America. Well, thank you very much, Representative Shea. We'll be watching this and seeing what happens. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me on, and, and uh, this bill is part of what we call the Freedom Agenda, Freedom Agenda Washington. The globalists have their agenda for tyranny. We have our agenda for freedom, and you can go on Facebook and check out Freedom Agenda Washington. That's where we post about all our bills going forward. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck. Bye-bye. All right. We're back again, and uh, I just thought it was really interesting that we're finally hearing some of our own representatives standing up to the uh, globalist agenda. Now, um, how do you like David Knight? He's a pretty good commentator and uh, really level-headed. He doesn't get all, you know, anxious and upset like Alex Jones. Uh, he works for Alex Jones, and uh, I would offer him as an alternative if you don't want to see the the fanatic yelling and screaming and shouting and posturing and all that 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 Jones does. Then look at David Knight. He's excellent, 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 and you get the news without the without the flair. And another person who works for Alex Jones is uh, Jakari Jackson. And uh, we have a report here uh, by Jakari Jackson, and he's going to be talking about another really important uh, issue. I don't know if you realize it, but Obama has been steadily changing, okay, steadily changing the uh, uh, top brass out. He's been purging. It's a real purge, purging generals and uh, mainly the people in charge of the nukes. It's, it's like uh, they, they don't pass the litmus test of whether they'll fire on Americans or obey unconstitutional orders or whatever it is and they're out. But let's see what Jakari Jackson has to say about it. And this is about a seven and a half or seven minute. When you minus the commercial, it's probably seven minutes. Nuke Commander Purge, another 34 missile officers terminated by the Air Force. Now, we've seen this been going on since the Dias Air Force nukes went missing. A lot of people said it was conspiracy theory, but, you know, these guys are ending up fired, so that's no theory. You can call it conspiracy, but it's definitely not a theory. A few short months after two top nuke commanders in the United States were removed from for minor offenses, an additional 34 nuke missile officers have been stripped of their certification because of a cheating scandal. They say these guys are up there texting each other like they're in high school, whether that's true or not. I mean, you have uh, the FBI having Patsies make bombs for the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. You have the ATF running guns into Mexico. You have the U.S. military guarding the poppy seeds out there, uh, out there in Afghanistan. And that's all well and good, well and keen, but if you text somebody an uh, answer, which I don't know if that's true or not, uh, you get purged from the military. Just any little minor offense they can do, that's what they're going to do. Not just this, but we see Obama coming out in the open saying that he doesn't want the CIA to control drones. He wants the Pentagon to do it, and I'm not saying I like either one of those guys controlling the drones because I'm not really for drones to begin with. But if you don't want to do the uh, the administration's dirty work, you will be purged from this military. So that goes out to all the uh, the guys out there. We've seen the guys, the hashtag, I did not join to serve al-Qaeda. But you do have the flip side of that, the guy saying you will shut up and do what you're told. So don't be one of those guys. Be somebody good on the right side of history. Now we'll move to this video. Nigel Farage, Europe is run by big banks, big business, and big bureaucrats. We are run now by big business, 
big banks and in the shape of Mr Barroso, big bureaucrats. And actually, that's what these European elections are really going to be all about. It's going to be a battle of national democracy versus EU state bureaucracy. And now we move on to an InfoWars special report concerning the DEA's response to marijuana legalization. The recent decision to decriminalize marijuana in Colorado has got the DEA worried. Going down the path to legalization in this country is reckless and irresponsible. It scares us. But it seems what's really scaring the Drug Enforcement Agency is the potential loss of blood money. Just one day prior to the Senate hearing this week, court documents revealed the DEA was smuggling billions of dollars in drugs with Mexico's notorious Sinaloa drug cartel in exchange for information on rival cartels. This is just another strike against the DEA that's causing the general public to question the drug trade's real source. Attorney General Eric Holder refused to prosecute HSBC last year when the bank was caught laundering billions in drug money for Mexican cartels. If you do prosecute, if you do bring a criminal charge, uh, it will have a negative impact on the national economy, perhaps even the world economy. And I think that is a function of the fact that some of these institutions have become too large. And in 2011, banking giant Wachovia received no criminal charges after they were found to have laundered more than $378 billion in drug money for the Sinaloa cartel as well. But incredibly, as cartel money laundering banks are protected by the federal government, the DEA has threatened those same banks with legal action if they store cash for small-time legal marijuana businesses in Washington and Colorado. As InfoWars has said for years, the DEA at the highest level is nothing more than a smuggling and protection agency for cartels that work with major banks. Unfortunately, the federal government's relationship with dangerous cartels goes much further. High-ranking Sinaloa member Jesus Zambada Niebla recently admitted that the cartel had received weapons from the U.S. government for years under Operation Fast and Furious. While the Obama administration claims the operation was just to track guns into Mexico, Niebla revealed the weapons were to be used for war with rival cartels. Ironically, Wednesday's Senate hearing was focused primarily on drug cultivation in Afghanistan, where the arrival of U.S. troops in 2001 has led to record-level opium production. The New York Times revealed one of Afghanistan's biggest drug kingpins was on the CIA payroll. The Taliban finances much of its operations by selling opium, which is grown from poppies, which are right now being harvested. So here's the question. Why are American troops now helping Afghan farmers grow that opium? Back to this decision to legalize marijuana for recreational use at the state level. This is a bad experiment. It's a bad, bad experiment. And it's going to cost the United States in, in, in terms of social costs. What about the social costs of incarcerating millions of Americans for the victimless crime of purchasing drugs? Drugs the agency itself has shipped in the country. Studies show the decriminalization of marijuana for recreational use could lessen the demand for illegal drugs being smuggled across the border. So what is the Drug Enforcement Agency so afraid of? Well, as states are reclaiming the powers reserved for them, as granted by the Tenth Amendment, Federal agencies are scrambling to maintain their stranglehold on the massive profits they receive from the illegal drug trade and the prison industrial complex. Bring me back. Yeah, they were about to break into another advertisement there. And um, I just wanted to say about that last issue about the marijuana. It's obvious. I mean, the whole point in legalizing it was to take the profit out of it. It should drop to 50 bucks or 100 bucks an ounce. I mean, the idea of keeping the insane profit in it just makes the, you know, a perfect market for the uh, black market. It, the black market will not go away if they keep the price as high as the black. I mean, the black market will be able to undercut the legal price. And that means that we still have a black market no matter what. OK, well, we don't have much time left about four, four minutes or so, and we just have a surprise guest here, Marcella Pena, and she's got an announcement about something happening this, what, next weekend? Yes, next here, weekend. Let me give you, Saturday? let me, okay, yeah. this is good for the sound guy. He, he really likes it when I mess with the mic, but I'll just give the mic to Marcella and then I'll be back. So something that Bill and I have in common is that we're both members of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, and um, I co-founded the Portland chapter of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, 
and right now we are doing monthly library presentations of the DVD 9-11 Experts Speak Out Explosive Evidence which um, goes into detail about the three skyscrapers which were brought down in New York City on 9-11 and um, this January, er, this January se uh, Saturday, January 25th, which right. is next Saturday, we're going to be having a library presentation at St. John's Library. It's from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, please go to our, to our website, portlandae911truth.org. Again, that is portlandae911truth.org for information on the address, again, the time, location. Um, next month for the month of February, we'll be, we'll be doing the Central Library. Um, so the date um, possibly right now yet to be announced, um, probably s second or third week. Um, so and yeah. Check with, have them check that website for Yes, updates. and <laughs> please do check the website, portlandae911truth.org. And in the month of uh, March, uh, David Chandler was among the videos that you were, you, you, um, you were exposed to in this last hour. Um, David Chandler actually was one of the first videos that you saw, and we will be having David Chandler will be in Eugene in the month of March, um, doing a presentation. So, well, by the way, we're trying to have this video so that he can take it with him to that. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, so That's so to if I get going, folks, if I get going. <laughs> yeah, so to find out more about David Chandler's uh, presentation in Eugene, please go again to Portland AE 911 Truth dot org for more information on that in our uh, January, February, and our library presentations. I also, don't go away, you're the mic. Yes. Oh, <laughs> you got yeah, the mic. Uh, I just wanted to remind people that David Chandler's website is uh, that 911speakout.org, 911speakout.org. And he has some of the best videos about 9-11 right on that <laughs> site. So that's yeah. a great place to go. And actually, for our December library presentation, we did it in Selwood, um, in Southeast Portland, in Selwood. And um, David Chandler was our guest speaker. And so we did our uh, presentation of 9-11 Experts Speak Out Explosive Evidence, or 9-11, uh, ex <laughs> yeah, right. Explosive Evidence Experts Speak Out. Um, and then, yeah, and then he gave, during the Q&A, he did a presentation. So, um, yeah, so, um, so David Chandler is actually in that DVD um, that I keep mentioning. 9-11 uh, Explosive Evidence Experts yeah, Speak Out. Three. Yeah, so, so David Chandler, uh, who we've, we've been mentioning and is going to be doing a presentation in Eugene in March, um, is, is a part of this DVD in terms of uh, the professionals and, um, that, are, that are asked to give their expert advice um, for the compilation of this DVD. Okay, hold that up so you can see it. David Chandler is a, was a professor of physics. Um, and so oh, he really goes, know. and so he really goes into the science. Um, Architects and Engineers for 9/11 Truth focuses on the three skyscrapers which fell in New York City on 9/11. Most people, especially on the West Coast, are only aware of two skyscrapers which fell on that day. The third skyscraper fell at around 5:20 p.m. Uh, in New York City. So anyway, these are among the things that we discuss in this DVD, which we present for free at libraries, uh, hopefully at a library close to you. Again, please go to our website, portlandae911truth.org. All right, so again, we're weekly now, so come back again next Saturday, same time, 5 o'clock. And by the way, go to my website on, on YouTube, 251 Omega, and read some of my comments to other blogs, and you'll see what kind of an asshole I am.